The best class I ever took in high school, I may have mentioned before, was typing. <laughs> Wasn't my favorite class by far. Uh, I really enjoyed math. I know that might make me weird, but I enjoyed math. I took Honors Algebra two the same year that I took uh, Geometry. I took Honors Algebra two as, uh, as an elective. That's how much I liked math. And, um, but uh, typing turned out to be the most useful throughout my life because I went into higher education, got uh, my uh, undergraduate degree, a graduate degree, a, a doctorate, and all of those things. It's good to not have to be able to write all of those papers by hunting and pecking on the keyboard, you know? And so uh, I'm, I'm pretty grateful for that class that I took uh, called typing. And back then it wasn't computers. It wasn't even the type of uh, typewriter that has the big ball in the middle that swings around. No, this is the old school type of typewriters. The one with the big arms that go cha-ching, cha-ching, you know, and that you type too close together and they get stuck together and then you got a mess. Uh, it was that type of thing. And so by the end of that first semester, I, I was typing 30 words per minute and I thought I'd reach my limit. And the, uh, the teacher said, now next semester, it's all about speed. Your grade will be based on speed. And I thought, sorry, I've reached my limit. I'm going to take tennis. Thank you very much. And so I did. I switched over to tennis. But I did get faster. And so even you know, today, uh, I can type 75 words a minute just because of practice. You know, It's all really muscle memory. You look at a word or you think of a word, and, and you can just type it out uh, by muscle memory. But every so often, your muscle memory will fail you. You get, you get these uh, uh, combination of letters that you think are supposed to go together. And so even in this message today, uh, we talk a little bit about angels. And in my notes as I was preparing some of my remarks, I uh, kept typing the word angle instead of angel. And I started to get upset about the whole thing because I kept making the same mistake over and over again. And I thought, well, you know, I told myself, stop it. Don't get upset about typing the word angle, you're just being obtuse. And so, <laughs> anyway, I was thinking this week about um, the constant danger that we are in of being drawn away from Christ. And uh, sometimes the things that might draw us away from Christ are not necessarily uh, sinful things, although that's, an, that's a possibility, you know, an actual temptation uh, where we have to make a choice whether we're going to be faithful to God or whether we're going to follow after this temptation. And by the way, every temptation that you face will be one of three things. It will either be a, uh, a, a lust of the flesh, a desire of your flesh, of your body because it feels good, or it'll be a, a desire of the eyes. You see something that you want, so you covet it, and you think, that's, that's good for me, and so you desire that thing with your eyes. Or it will be the sinful pride of life, the boastful pride of life. And so every temptation you face will be one of those three things. So be on the lookout for those three things. But sometimes the things that might draw us away from Christ are uh, more distractions than they might be actual sinful things. So, for example, for me, um, I love sports. I used to love playing sports, but now I love watching sports and and uh, I, I will watch just about any kind of sport. I, I like watching the big three, football, basketball, baseball. I like watching hockey. I like even watching European soccer. You know, they call it football over there for some reason. I'd like to go to a game in Europe and be one of the fans for a day and see if I survive. That would be fun. And uh, I like all kinds of sports. I even like, uh, what do they call it when they, they push the rocks down the ice in the Olympics? Um, curling, right. And, I, you know, you watch that, there's so much drama going on with the curling. It's like, whoa, you know, it's going to hit something else. But so I, I really enjoy liking and watching sports. But if I'm not careful, this thing that's called sports, which is not necessarily sinful, because you can watch sports or engage in sports for the glory of God, but it can get out of hand. You know, it can begin to take over your calendar, take over your life, and, and get you in a, in a position where you actually begin to... It begins to drift you away from Christ. It begins to draw you away from Christ. And one of the temptations, I think, that a lot of uh, parents these days 
uh, face is um, when their kids are involved in sports. And more and more often the sports want to draw, them, draw the kids away from being in church on Sunday. Uh, this past Sunday when, I'm, uh, when I was out on vacation, Amy and I went to uh, a friend's church uh, over at New Home Baptist Church. L.J. Wright's the pastor that said, how things are going? And he said, good. He said, we're, we're battling Little League. I knew what he meant, battling Little League. You know, because every parent thinks that their child is the next Mike Trout. And so I, I've got to make sure that I spend, you know, 50 grand on my kid, taking my kid to every tournament all over creation, missing church week after week after week, hoping that my child will uh, somehow get a scholarship, which most often does not come to fruition. And it's, it not only becomes a waste of money, but wasted time. Because you never know on which Sunday that child who should have been in church, that might have been the Sunday that God had something to say. To that child. And so I would just tell parents uh, to be cautious, be careful about that type of thing. You know, so for me, I have to watch out, make sure sports doesn't become, you know, a God that's in competition with the Lord. But it could be other things, you know, for you. It might be a relationship that you have with somebody. Whether it's a romantic relationship or any kind of relationship, any kind of friendship, you need to evaluate your relationships and And ask yourself, is this other person in my life, are they drawing me away from Christ or are they drawing me to Christ? I think that's a fair question to ask. It could be work. Now, every one of us, you know, unless you're retired, needs to work. You know, we need to make income is the way the world goes. But if you're not careful, again, your work can become so important to you that you let your relationship with Christ sort of become secondary or tertiary. And so you want to be careful about that. It could be any type of thing. All these things are good things. Sports can be good. Work is good. Relationships are good. These are necessary things. But sometimes if we're not careful, if we do nothing at all, maybe simply out of ignorance and maybe simply out of uh, just being lazy, we automatically drift away from Christ. Well, in the passage that we're going to look at today, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23, The Apostle Paul deals with three separate things that might help Satan actually pull Christians away from their relationship with Christ. These are dangers that we need to be attentive to. And so I would invite you to take your Bible and turn to Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. In Colossians 2, verse 16 through 23, if you found the place, I'd ask you to stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word. The words will be on the screen behind me if you prefer to read along that way. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23, this is what we read. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food or drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. He doesn't hold on to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with growth from God. If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to its regulations? Don't don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. Although these have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. Father, I pray that you would open up our minds to your word, and that you might speak to us through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The first thing that Paul mentions that might be a danger to us and causing us to drift away from Christ is what I might call ceremonial religiosity. And by that I mean all the ceremonies and the rituals of religion. You know, sometimes... If we put too much of our focus on these things, it might actually cause us 
to take our focus off of Christ himself. And so you even see this sometimes with Christians who want to um, really get into the Old Testament, really get into the Old Testament law. And they'll, and they'll say, well, hey, all of it's there in the Old Testament. Therefore, all of it is supposed to be followed. All of it's supposed to be obeyed. And I would, and I would say, it's true, all of it is in the Word of God. And every little word of the Word of God is there for our benefit. But you have to understand that not everything in the Word of God is a prescription for you. Do you understand the difference between a diagnosis from your doctor and a prescription from your doctor? Do you understand the difference between what is prescribed for you and what might be described in the Word of God? And so there are things that we find, especially in the Old Testament, ceremonial aspects of the law, that are described for you and me today. And there's benefit in understanding those things, but those things were prescribed for Israel and not necessarily for us. And today I want to show you how the Old Testament law should fit into your life and into my life. And so on the screen behind me, you'll see the beginning of a timeline. And about 4,000 years ago, around 2000 B.C., plus or minus a decade or a century or so, there was this guy by the name of Abram. God later changed his name to Abraham. And God gave Abram a promise. And that's the key word when you think about Abraham. It's a promise. And in Genesis chapter 12, God gave Abraham this promise. Essentially, he said, Abram, I'm going to make you a great and mighty nation. You're going to have many descendants. I'm going to make you a great and mighty nation. And by the way, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. This was the essence of God's promise to Abram. And so you had this promise that uh, continued on for a long period of time as the nation of Israel, which came from Abraham, began to grow. And some centuries later, Around 1446 B.C., there was uh, this guy, Moses. And uh, you probably know the story of Moses. We won't go over the whole story. But at one point in Moses' life, God gave Moses the law. And the law really is encapsulated in the Ten Commandments. You remember that great movie, Charlton Heston? Before it was a movie, it was in the book. And, And the Ten Commandments were actually written by the finger of God and given to Moses. And there are a bunch of other commandments also that that stemmed from those Ten Commandments, both positive and negative commands from God. And so all of these commands were given to Moses. This was God's law. And so you had the promise given to Abraham. You had the law given to Moses. And these things continued on until... There was this person who came along who is Christ, Christ Jesus. And around A.D. 33, about 2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, Christ Jesus died on a cross for our sins. And he rose from the grave a few days later. And a few days after that, a little while after that, Jesus ascended to heaven. And not too long after that, the Holy Spirit came into the lives of believers. And and this multifaceted event began an era of grace. And we today live in this era of grace. Now, what happened to the promise that God made to Abraham? Here's what happened. Jesus fulfilled and is still to this day fulfilling... The, law, the promise that God gave to Abraham. And so in other words, look at it this way. All throughout the Old Testament, nobody fulfilled the promise that God gave to Abraham. No one could do it. But Jesus did it. He fulfilled that promise. And by the way, he's still fulfilling it today. Remember, the promise to Abraham was this, that all of the nations of the world would be blessed 
through Abraham. And so through Abraham came Israel, through Israel came Christ Jesus. And for you and I are missionaries, and we decide to give up our lives and to go to the remotest parts of the world and to take the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, to people who've never heard of his message, then we have a role in fulfilling and helping God really fulfill through Christ the promise that he made to Abraham to be a blessing to all of the nations of the world. And even if you and I are not for any reason capable of being a missionary that might do that, when you and I also engage in missions through our giving and our prayers, we have a role in seeing that promise fulfilled. The promise given to Abraham is fulfilled in Christ. And that promise still stands to this day. But what about the law? And the law is really what got us to this point today. How do we interact with the law of God? Is the law nullified now that Christ has come? Is the law just, we don't have to think about it, we don't have to do it? No, the law is still in effect. The law is still in effect. You see, the law of God that he gave to Moses was so pure, and it was so holy, and it was so right that not even Moses himself could obey it. And nobody else in all of the Old Testament could perfectly obey the law that God had given. The law essentially communicated this to all of humanity. You can't obey it. The law cannot save you. But when Christ came and he lived his life, and he died on that cross. Christ perfectly accomplished the law. The first and only one to ever be able to do that. And he did it. He accomplished the law. And so now, for you and me, how do we relate to the law? There's a little bit of a, little bit of a paradox that you'll see on the screen. By faith in Jesus Christ... Two things happen. By faith, you and I are freed from the law. Also, by faith, we uphold the law. And you might say, well, how can those two things be true? They seem to sort of be opposite or antithetical to one another. How can they be true? Let me explain it this way. Let's suppose you have a, a teenager at home, and some of you are are uh, blessed enough to still have a teenager at home, and God bless you, we will pray for you. <laughs> but let's say you have a teenager at home, and you decide as the parent you're going to create a law. And it's called the law of lawn mowing. And every Saturday, that law of lawn mowing will go into effect. And so if the law of lawn mowing is fulfilled, it means that teenager has taken the lawnmower and they have mowed the lawn every single Saturday. That's what the law says to do. But if the law is broken, there are punishments. And so there's punishments if the law is broken. There are blessings if the law is fulfilled. If the law is fulfilled, the teenager still gets to eat. Still gets to be clothed. Still gets to live under your roof. Certain blessings come with obeying the law. But then as a parent, you decide one day to set your teenager free from the law of lawn mowing. And you approach your teenager and you say, Blessed teenager, I, out of my mercy, am setting you free from the law of lawn mowing. No longer is the burden of having to mow the lawn every Saturday placed upon you. You are free from it. Do you know what your teenager will do at that point? That next Saturday, your teenager, out of the love in his or her heart, will go out to the lawnmower, will crank that thing up, and will voluntarily, freely decide to mow the lawn 
even though they've been set free. Now, you're laughing at that because you and I both know the nature of teenagers. You and I both know that teenagers are not mature enough to do that on their own. That's why they need the law. You and I both know that teenagers don't have enough love in their heart for their mother even on Mother's Day to obey that law even though they've been freed from it. Now, we're having a little bit of fun here, but the reality is that is exactly what Jesus has done for us. Jesus has, by faith, freed us from having the burden of obeying the law of God, which is so burdensome. We're free from it. But by faith, and because of the love in our heart for God, we obey it. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a couple of passages of Scripture that I want you to see. In Romans chapter 3, verse 31, it asks this question. Do we nullify the law through faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. And then... In Galatians 5.14, Paul puts it all together. He says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, when you think just about the Ten Commandments, let's just think about the commandments that have to do with our relationship to other people. Okay, Commandments 5 and following. If we have love in our hearts, we will obey those Ten Commandments naturally. If you have love in your heart for your mama, you're going to honor your mama. If you have love in your heart for your daddy, you're going to honor your daddy. That's commandment number five. Commandment number six, murder. Thou shalt not do that thing, right? If you have love for your neighbor, you're not going to murder your neighbor. Commandment 7, if you have love for your neighbor, you're not going to commit adultery with your neighbor. If you have love for your neighbor, you're not going to steal from your neighbor. If you have love for your neighbor, you're not going to lie to or about your neighbor. And if you have love for your neighbor, you're not going to covet your neighbor's things. You see, love fulfills the law. Jesus said it this way. If you love me, obey my commandments. That's what love does. Love fulfills the law. Love obeys the law. Do you have the burden placed upon you? No. You do it freely, by faith, out of love, and it's a joy. So the law is still in effect today. But I want you to understand something else about the law. There is a distinguishing made in the New Testament between the ethical law of God and the ceremonial laws that God gave Israel. And you might say, well, oh, preacher, you're just reading that into Scripture. You're just making that up. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19, look what Paul says. He says, circumcision, that's a ceremony for Israel. He says, circumcision, the ceremonial part of the law, does not matter. And uncircumcision does not matter. And then Paul makes the, distinct, the distinction. He says, keeping God's commands is what matters. Do you understand? There is a distinction made by Paul himself between the ceremonial parts of the law and the ethical parts of the law. The ethical parts of the law are timeless. They are eternal. Don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery. Those things are timeless. 
the ceremonial parts of the law? That's what Paul is talking about in verses 16 and 17 of Colossians chapter 2. Look at it again. He says, therefore, don't let anyone judge you with regard to food. That's a ceremony. Drink, ceremonial. Or in the matter of a festival, ceremonial. Or a new moon, ceremonial. Or a Sabbath day, ceremonial. He says, those, those things, these are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. Do you understand the difference between a shadow and the substance? This is the difference. I dare any of you men today who are married to do this. When you go home today for the rest of the day, do not interact with your wife. Do not talk to her. Do not look at her. Instead, Look at her shadow. Talk to her shadow. Interact with her shadow. Now, none of you men who have half a brain will take me up on that dare. Why? Because you like peace in the house. Happy wife, happy life. It makes no sense if you've got the real thing to interact with the shadow, does it? No, you, we wouldn't do that. But that's what we're doing if we get all caught up in the ceremonial aspects of the law as Christians. And we think, oh, I have to obey this ceremony and this festival and this new moon and the Sabbath day. And Paul says, no, you're missing out on Christ. He's the real thing. He's the real deal. And so even the ceremonial religiosity that might otherwise be good or be something that we can study or th something that can point us to Christ, even that can draw our attention away from Christ. So we must be careful. Paul mentions a second thing in verses 18 and 19, and it's spiritual mysticism. Mysticism, by that you know what I mean. I'm talking about people that get all uh, caught up, and Christians, uh, Christians especially are easily duped into doing this getting all caught up in uh, spiritual visions and dreams and, and prophecies and all of these wonderful things. And, and I had a vision of an angel and I had a vision of this and I had a vision of that. And people get all caught up in these things. And Christians are easily duped into, into this because we do, as Christians, believe in a spiritual realm. I mean, we do. and We believe that, uh, that angels do exist and, and uh, that these things are really true. But if you're not careful, you can get all caught up in all of this type of mysticism that you miss Christ. Paul puts it this way in the beginning of verse 18. He says, Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. And So apparently there are people there at... at uh, uh, in Colossae, Christians there in Colossae, who are being tempted to really abase themselves and humble themselves and go without food and go without water and go without showering and go without cleansing themselves and, and, and go without any type of medicine or care for themselves. And they've become such miserable creatures uh, like Gollum almost. They've become these miserable creatures who would finally get themselves into an altered state of reality. And once they were in this altered state of reality, they began to have visions. And, and if you understand the, 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 the terminology there, they were actually having visions of angels that were humbling themselves, visions of angels that were worshiping God, and they began to put their focus on these angels that they were having visions of instead of placing their focus on Christ. And Paul says, you know, this, this is not good, and he can... He says in the rest of verse 18 and verse 19, why? He says, such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual minds. Can you imagine being so spiritual that you're actually unspiritual? That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, these people aren't extra spiritual. They're less spiritual than you. Keep your focus on Christ. And the person who does this, Paul says in verse 19, he, that person who does this, doesn't hold on to the head, 
Well, who's the head? Christ. Christ is the head of the body. But these people are, are, are not holding on to the head. He says, He doesn't hold on to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with growth from God. It's like these people are loose tendons or ligaments just floating around the body. Can you imagine a child as the child is growing up? The bones grow at a certain rate, and the muscles grow at the same type of rate, and, the, and all of the tendons and the ligaments, everything just works in harmony. But can you imagine a child having some type of loose tendon, loose ligament, just sort of floating around in the body, doing nobody any good whatsoever? What's the point? It's probably causing the child pain. Paul's basically saying that's what you're like if, you're, if you place your focus off of Christ and begin to worship other spiritual creatures, other angels, or you get into these mystical experiences, you have no good function for the body of Christ. You could actually cause people to be led astray. And I find it interesting, just as an aside, that so many of the uh, uh, Christian preachers and teachers that are out there that uh, claim so many visions from God, I heard from God, this is directly from God, and they turn out with their prophecy to be wrong. To be absolutely wrong. What's going on there? If you heard from God, you're not going to be wrong with your prophecy. God is never wrong. You either didn't hear from Him, or you're a false teacher. You either misled, or you yourself are a false teacher leading people astray intentionally. You need to be careful who you listen to. As Christians, we have so much access on the internet and everywhere else, on the radio, to all kinds of Christian teachers and preachers. You need to be careful who you listen to. If you come across someone that has a word from God and it's a, and it's a prophecy that's supposed to be fulfilled in six months and it doesn't happen, that person's not from God. They're certainly not listening to, worth listening to. And so you have all types of mysticism. And finally, a third thing, and it's sort of related to the second, is asceticism. Asceticism basically says, my body is bad, but my soul is good. Well, that's just not biblical. That's a Greek dualistic view of things, where the spiritual is good, the physical is bad. No, no, no. That's not what God teaches. Back to Genesis chapter 1. God made the world, and he called it, Good. Your body is good. Well, I don't like what I see in the mirror. It's still good. Even if your body is handicapped to one degree or another, it's still good. God has made all things good. And so in verses 20 through 22, we read, If you died with Christ to the elements of this world. And, and Paul has already established that. You have, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have died to the elements of this world. Because when you became one with Christ through faith, when Christ died on the cross, you participated in that, and you've died to the elements of this world. So if you've died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle don't taste. Don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They're human commands and doctrines. These aren't from God. They're human commands. Paul's basically saying, why are you obeying human commands? What are you, a worldling? You know what a worldling is? A worldling obeys its master, the world. A worldling just goes along with the crowd. Is that what God has called you to? Are you nothing but a worldling? And so, you don't obey that master. You have a new master. Your master is Christ. Don't obey the world. Paul says in verse 23, Although these things, all these things have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they're not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. You see, there is a point in which we, like Paul says, buffet our bodies in order to obey God. But we don't engage in asceticism where we call things that God has created and He's called good, we call them bad. No. It is not a sin 
to enjoy life. It's not. This is a good world, and God wants you to have a good time. God wants you to worship him through having a good time. There's a lot of Christians that think, well, I'm spiritual because I'm angry. No, I don't think so. You know, angry and malfeasance and bitterness, these are not spiritual gifts. Jesus said, I have come so that they might have joy. Not anger and bitterness. So be careful who you listen to, you know, with these masters of misery. They're all around. The joy of the Lord is to be our strength. So God wants you to enjoy your life. Think about all of the good things that God has done. Think about this good world. God has made mountains, I'm told. They're over in New Mexico or somewhere. God has made mountains. He's made rivers. Again, I'm told. God has made lakes. He's made oceans. God has made all of the things of this world. God has made every single cloud in the sky. You know what all of the nations of the world can't do? They can't make a cloud. They can can put crystals in the air and try to make the clouds form, but guess what? The crystals themselves were made by God, and and so so was all the moisture that eventually makes that cloud. God makes the clouds. Everything God has made is good. Enjoy it. God has made steak fajitas for us. Amen. Enjoy it. You don't have to be miserable to be a Christian. In fact, the most joyful people in the world should be those that know their Creator and believe that their Creator is good to them and has blessed them. Every single one of you here, whether your mother is still living or not, whether you know your biological mother or not, you have reason to be grateful. Because somebody some time ago decided to give birth to you. And you might say, well, I've had a hard life. A hard life is still a good life. It really is. You've been blessed beyond measure. Every single one of us has. More than we can ever imagine, more than we could ever count. God has blessed us. And so let's be a blessing to God in return. Let's give him the praise that he is due. Let's live for him. And through love, you and I can obey him.